Welcome to Art in the Raw, Conversations with Creative People. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Stephen Guerin. Stephen is a computer scientist that likes to employ creative methods within his work. If this is our first time meeting, I'm your host, Ann Kelly. Now, you might be wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I'm someone that has been in love with art my entire life. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for about 15 years now. And about halfway through 2020, I started Art in the Raw as a way to keep people connected and inspired. And if you'd like to know a little bit more, take a look at the description below. But in the meantime, I'm excited to introduce you to Stephen. Welcome, Stephen. Hello, thank you, Anne. Very cool to be here remotely yeah. so you're in santa fe as well looks like you're on your your patio that's right in the backyard looking looking for some clouds so yeah steven and i met based upon our mutual love of of winter sports and got to talking about a variety of other topics and and you do a lot of different things but i've heard you described as a computer scientist, but, but overall, the reason I, I wanted to talk today is it seems that you typically bring a very creative approach to your investigations. Fantastic. Recently, what have you been focused on? We do a lot of work in the wildfire world. 2009, we made a product here in Santa Fe that made it easier for firefighters to be trained using physical sand tables. For a hundred years, they would train on sand tables with matchbox cars and yarn and cotton to represent the smoke, just like as kids playing in a sand table or the military. And around 2009, we augmented that with projection. And then we would watch the projector with cameras to make a feedback system where we would make the surface interactive. That was uh, so that then we could present all the uh, mapping or the geographic information system, the GIS, to show elevation and vegetation or fuels, and then to simulate the wildfire and the traffic evacuations and basically the response to the fire as well. Uh, I got to know the community over the last 11 years, mostly in the West, but also Canada and Spain and over in Australia, so where a lot of the wildfires are. And recently, or at least in the last since, um, five years, looking at how communities can coordinate during an incident, and especially when a lot of the intel starts with the citizens on their phone cameras and on social media, and ultimately it needs to get back out to the citizens. So in the beginning, we were very focused on the crews and the professionals themselves. But in the last uh, five years, it's how do we coordinate all the cameras that are, are streaming in? And it could be from five to hundreds of thousands of images. And how can we make a scene out of that in real time and, and measure where the fire is and track where it is? Um, so that's, that's really been our focus for the last five years and really in trying to understand how, you know, the lens and the geometry of cameras and how we can um, lock those in because your GPS with machine vision uh, common points, you can reduce that uncertainty. Well, in so addition to the SIM table being used in a very practical application, you have also shown it at Currents Art Fair. You are saving lives with this invention, but then it's also it also has this art application. You know, Santa Fe is a special place and extend it down to northern New Mexico in general. I think there's a lot of interest and researchers looking at projective art. And Currents is one of the international projective art shows or interactive new media. The College of Santa Fe was here. They had the Vision Art uh, Festival too. We have people exploring new ways of making interactive light. So the sim table at the end of the day is an interactive light. And we more generally call that any surface computing. So, you know, technology hopefully will kind of disappear into the woodwork, literally, as the projectors become where our light bulbs are. And then as you have more and more cameras in the room or outside, that interaction could make all surfaces interactive. So there's a lot that affords for an artist or 
different kinds of collaboration, especially when it's interactive. That projection mapping is a space, but, but as soon as you can make that dynamic and interactive, interface in general will change in computing. That right now we're very screen mediated or in things like augmented reality. If I want to hold up my phone and you know label that mountain peak or uh, what's going on, it's screen mediated. But what if that digital information comes out into the room or into the rail yard and overlays the, the pixels onto the surfaces. That, that's a very strong interest of ours. And opening up a platform for people to author that. So on a basic level, the, the table, it, it is sand, just for those who haven't experienced it, it is sand and you are projecting onto it, but it doesn't have to be sand. And I'd read a little bit about any surface. Any surface literally means any surface in the room. And the sand table is an example of that. And there's nothing digital or, or electronic on the table. It, it literally is a box of sand or a, or a table with sand on it. All of the electronics is above it. So it's three parts, a computer, a projector, and a camera. You know, those three working together. You know, the computer and the camera could be a phone, right? Hooked up to a projector. It's already happening where Android is being built into projectors. So the computer and the projector come together as a, as a piece, right? So if you have those three and, and having ultimately many projectors, many cameras, and many computers, how do you get those to work together in a very distributed or decentralized way to make an interactive space? So that gets into projector blending, projector warping, but you know the cameras can help do that process automatically. So the room becomes a seamless space. So instead of programming windows like we tend to do on a, a computer or a phone, program a surface, like a table surface or a chair surface. And there may be one, one projector may be hitting multiple surfaces at the same time, or multiple projectors may be covering the same surface. So you want to abstract that out for the artist or the uh, software uh, designer. So they just care about the surfaces. They don't have to worry about dealing with that part of it. So I'm curious, in, in the years that you've shown the table at Currents, have you had the opportunity to hang out around the table and, and watch people interact? Yeah, mainly in other venues, you know, in schools or to the use was for training firefighters. Mm -hmm. But since 2012, we've really seen a lot more use of educating the public. So firefighters going out to a neighborhood meeting and letting them pull up their neighborhood bring in the elevation for their neighborhood and letting the neighbors sculpt the sand together, the terrain, and get a real tangible feeling for their terrain, uh, which you know affects fire behavior. Fire wants to go uphill and, and downwind, but also water and flooding, you know, dealing with watersheds and dam breaks. So that's what we get to observe more in that context, watching community members and a lot of times kids uh, interacting with it. Art. And, and science used to be a little more connected. And so being able to introduce this technology that has this visual application and to kind of share it with the general public in an art forum is just really valuable. First of all, Santa Fe is a special place. I was attracted here initially for the science around Santa Fe Institute. And then I guess the, you know, the natural beauty, you know, the culture obviously grows on you and the, the mix of communities and so the science, tech, and art communities, I think there's strong veins uh, in Santa Fe, very deep in, in all three, and also in the spiritual traditions as well, right? So if you combine all four, and it's very natural to cross boundaries here. Many people have uh, a you know, foot in many of those communities. And you, know, you mentioned science and art being different. You know, in New Mexico, we're blessed with a lot of generative artists, and that kind of captures the idea of people taking algorithms and iterating them and, and, and looking at the patterns that form and looking for the aesthetic, not worrying about is this modeling you know, fluid dynamics. Although as you model fluid dynamics, you get at those same kind of patterns. And it's, we, we respond to those and, and how fractals emerge and how turbulence and eddies form. So I think it's, a, it's an exciting time where science and art tech and even uh, spiritual understanding are having a dance right now. And it's uh, very exciting. And I think Santa Fe is one of those places in the world that's really pushing the envelope. Is that what inspired you to move here yeah, originally? Totally. Mm -hmm. yeah. You spent some time in 
China and you went to school in Arizona. Where are you from originally? East of Cleveland in, in a small town called Chardon. Santa Fe just caught your attention and you just decided that that was the place that had all these things going on. Going through undergrad in economics and uh, Asian studies, I got interested in feedback systems and economic systems in the 80s. Now, I grew up with computing, you know, as a child of the, you know, I graduated 86 high school. So the sixth grade, you know, the TRS-80 was big in the in the 70s. My father uh, had one of those. So learning to, to program early on, you know, by the time I was in college, I was simulating, but didn't really know what that was called when I was looking at systems. And really enjoyed, you know, kind of looking at feedback systems. When I went over to China uh, in from 94 to 97, you know, the web was breaking out in 93, 94. Prior to that, in 1990, doing a lot with uh, graphics and pre-press. How do you put together a magazine, scan images, uh, do the color separations, right? So a lot of color theory, and I really enjoyed that. And I think we have a shared interest in the old days of the the Irish printers in the early 90s and, and yeah. just the whole whole side of graphics and, and color. But, and when the web came out, I really also appreciated the real-time nature when you're publishing. And instead of waiting for a match print, you got something wrong, that whole two or three-day cycle, right? Kids today, they don't, you know, we just had green or orange screens, right? When I was in you know, China from 94 to 97, you know, looking at how information and the web and the internet was breaking into China and we were helping Chinese ministries and embassies and multinationals and individuals get online uh, but also you're kind of expecting a radical change in government you know this is just pre you know a couple of years after Tiananmen and you know looking at how information propagated through China the, the students when they were demonstrating in the in 89 kind of repurposed one of Mao's slogans, uh, seek truth through facts, F-A-C-T-S, but they changed it to facts, F-A-X. So they were organizing by sending intel around via fax machines. I was kind of expecting a major freedom of information to break through the authoritarian top-down structures of the Chinese you know, government. I called it the, the Great Firewall of China was a term that I I just started using it and the, the, the press picked it up. I got interested in how systems self-organized, you know, whether it's how an economy works or how ants find food or flocking. And from a distance, seeing a lot of the research coming out of Santa Fe, there was a lot of, there were a lot of popular books and articles that were making it over to me. And from Beijing, I knew that that's where, uh, you know, I knew something special was going on, you know, in, in the same way that Prague had a certain period of time, right? We talked about that, or Berlin or Florence or in China in the 12th century, Hangzhou and the philosophers, uh, great philosophies uh, came out in these bustling kind of noisy cities. And and again, I think Santa Fe has that potential uh, to be a place of kind of new kinds of thinking. And that, that's what attracted me. Long way to answer. That's what why Santa Fe. So I am curious when you were in middle school, high school, kind of that age, was there a, a profession that you had in mind? Yeah, I didn't have a profession in mind. And you know, right at 22, I started with a, you know, with my father, an Apple bar, value-added reseller, when the Macintosh and pre-presses I mentioned. The graphic side really appealed to me. And I wasn't necessarily artistic in the traditional sense in middle school or high school. Technical, but not engineer. So I did like, you know, what can you do with technology? Creatively would probably be an easier way to sum it up, but not not so far down in the weeds. Like I didn't take computer science in college or you know, I was more liberal arts. But but graphics has always appealed to me. Interactive graphics, stuff that's static, while it's while it's interesting, I always like the interactive. And you know, the whole space of human computer interaction. So how do you how do computers interact? And ultimately, how can computers kind of get out of the way and have human human interaction? Really like solutions that are elegant and adaptive themselves and they're not like brute force a lot of computing to make it happen you know what's the minimal computing you need to mm -hmm. to do what you want and i think the best algorithms at the end of the day work that way uh even in in in, in art um you know this has very simple rules but from that we get very complex behavior which is you know part of what complexity is about as well complexity at the emergent level but usually below that 
are very, very simple rules of interaction. So if you were, say, back in your early 20s, looking at yourself today, would, would you be surprised what you're up to? Yes, yeah, certainly wouldn't have been, um, like, I wasn't interested at all or drawn to wildfire. But, but that's a case where, you know, we're only, part, we're in charge of half of what we're, we become. You know, the, the other half is the environment we're in, right? And where we're needed, I guess. So I am, so I would be very surprised I was spending, you know, now 12 years in wildfire. Needed a solution and you were responding to that. But you mentioned your liberal arts focus. When did the scientific explorations enter the picture? I was a young Catholic schoolboy, altar boy, getting you know, why are we here and uh, religious sensibility from that space. Mm -hmm. uh, those kind of questions have always stayed with me. The early metaphors that you know, teach a six-year-old, you know, God the Father in the, as, as, a, as a bearded man in the clouds, you know, the Trinity took me so far, but, you know, the truths were there. Well, where does organization come from? Where does structure come from? You know, whether it's in an economy or in the early 90s, I got very interested in artificial life. Can we make living systems in the computer or in the lab? So wet versus uh, like wet a life. Uh, but but I, I was always, uh, you know, I was attracted to the digital. And, and again, a lot of the research coming out of Santa Fe and the questions of what is life? And these are, you know, philosophical questions as well as science. You know, they're scientific, but you're getting into physics, metaphysics, and philosophy. The questions of what is a living system, you know, we keep pushing the boundary out. You know, we're getting more sophisticated answers. It's always going to be a question. And, you know, what is, what is, what is life? What is distributed intelligence? Which is also, get, as, you, as you start to think about collective intelligence or how, for instance, like the cells of your body are part of a larger system that has more collective intelligence that that cell could not comprehend, but is certainly a part of. You know, you're starting to get back to a spiritual questions. You know, are we part of a larger body that has greater intelligence and has greater power than an individual cell or person? And you know, to me, it's, it's obviously yes. But people are transitioning as a as a society. You know, Darwin has taken us so far, but I think it's it really has a hyper focus on the individual. And some of my colleagues again at SFI. Are starting to define life as not a property of the individual, but a property of the whole system, and, and that's a very profound change of thinking. That that we're one again, one half of the of the process. There's always the other half, the the, the dual. We do a lot of work with the Santa Fe Institute. They do a lot of amazing things, and and one of the things I've missed this last year is the, the interplanetary festival. Everything from concerts to projections to different talks and beyond. And you know, over the last uh, 12, 15 years, I've been a faculty in the Complex Systems Summer School, which is you know, basically graduate students. It's, a, it's an awesome four-week program. And just like graduate school, it's, it's more about the other students that you get to interact with from around the mm -hmm. world. And they're all very uh, interested in interdisciplinary thinking. And so you mentioned the interplanetary. Uh, I think that you know, really spearheaded by uh, the vision of David Krakauer, the current president. A lot of this idea of you know what's it take to become an interplanetary species, and to be to be that you know how do you get that first planet in order, right? Uh, so it's it's not just about you know let's go to Mars, but how do we how do we make sure the the, the systems you know, of the earth support that kind of exploration, right? So, so I think that interplanetary festival is though, it's an opportunity to think bigger. I, I do appreciate all the different, you know, authors and artists that all coming together to make that event. You know? Okay, so I work around the corner from Y'all Wolf. I was going for a walk the other day and I kept seeing all of these stickers on, on poles around Y'all Wolf that said birdsaren'treal.com. There's actually this website that claims a, CIA killed all the birds in the 70s and replaced them with drones to to spy on us. Just curious yeah, I, if you've ever stumbled on this before. I just found it last week. So. Yeah, you asked me at the beginning if there's anything I don't want to talk about. Uh, I, I, I'm not able to talk about that. I'm teasing. 
<laughs> Though I will say what we are working on now is how do you have community intelligence without becoming a surveillance society? All these cameras, how can we collectively render the smoke in the air but still keep our backyard private from the same image? And there's a cute term called surveillance instead of su surveillance. Mm -hmm. If you uh, Wikipedia that, S-O-U-S, French from below. The sur is from above. And the ethos of Santa Fe, too, is this bottom-up, how do you have bottom-up collective intelligence? So uh, whether if there are drones in the sky, I think we need to combat them with mm -hmm. our, our bottom-up surveillance system to track those drones. And, and then the, you know, the other cute term is undersight versus oversight. So how, how do the citizens collectively figure out what's going on? Look at COVID. We had the intel on our phones of our physician to know where the epidemic and the contagion was happening. But we weren't able to coordinate that information. You know, China did a good job of coordinating it, but they did it from a top-down government approach. You know, if you use any kind of digital currency in China from WePay or Alipay from Alibaba or Tencent, you know, those are state-run enterprises for the most part. I mean, they're they're definitely free market, but you know, 10% are government uh, employees as well. So they have that intel on you as well as you know, all the facial recognition of the street cameras. But in the US, of course, we don't want that kind of world where the government has that much surveillance. Most of our data is up with the corporate, right? With uh, Google or Verizon or Apple, they know our location, but they don't have the incentive to help us coordinate during COVID. You know, you saw some efforts, but certainly didn't use our physician data that they have. So we need new forms of intelligence that is not top down. And that was something you were looking at a little bit in terms of tracking wildfires. I'd heard you talk about if everybody, say, in an area that there was a wildfire could use their cell phone to contribute to solving the problem, essentially, which, which is, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. We all have these devices. How do, you know, how do we collectively come together to... Right. And the security wow. cameras on our home as well. Yeah. But without birds spying on us. Maybe one day if we can learn to talk to the, the real birds, we can uh, coordinate with them as well. They can give us some of their, their thoughts of what they're seeing, perhaps. Late 50s or 60s, yeah, there was also in China problems with uh, the birds eating the crops. So, you mm -hmm. know, in Beijing, they would kill all the birds and clap pa uh, pans together until they fell out of the sky exhausted because uh, they had no place to land. But but then you had all kinds of mosquitoes and flies and other kind of pests that came about. So if you think too narrowly or linearly on uh, let's solve this problem and then let's, uh, you know, you get different kind of knock-on consequences. Like let's like reduce carbon. I mean, of course you want to uh, reduce that, but there's, it's not just that. There's a much bigger, you know, coupled systems to deal with as well, let's say, say in climate change. You probably noticed that there was this giant murmuration of, of ravens kind of near the ski area parking lot this winter. And I don't mm -hmm. remember them being there in past years, but it inspired me to look into it. And apparently ravens tend to stick together in large groups during the winter, but not in the summer. But I think they must have had a big nesting place near, near the ski area parking lot this winter because I don't remember seeing them in that way in past years. Sure. No, I definitely saw them this year. And are they called murders like crows? Uh, they're, they're called um, an, an unkindness, okay. but there was a lot of them, enough enough to take notice for me to look it up and, and like, why, why are all of these ravens flying in circles around the parking lot? Um, well, well, this will be another example of... Um, the everyday observation versus wildfires, right? So if we, so we're very interested in training people to observe. You know, so bird watching. You know, many people are into tracking airplanes. You know, all these. You know, there's what's called the long tail of communities. All these little specialty interests that one image can be of interest to many communities, right? I might be watching the fire, but someone else is watching. You know, they're tracking the SpaceX Starlink satellite mm -hmm. like what you saw uh this weekend other people might be tracking meteors coming into the atmosphere and if they have multiple shots they can get the 3d track so w i guess what i'm saying is we have enough cameras to track where the ravens are over the years you know there's other crowdsource tools like project budburst when 
when are the different flowers coming into season or when are the birds migrating, you know, that kind of stuff. So I think it's a time of, of observation and also just generally in technology, we tend to name like web 1.0, web 2.0. 2.0 is when we got more social networks and user generated content. Web 3 now is starting to talk about the spatial web. Not only are we doing a lot better mapping on the web, but we're capturing reality, the, the augmented reality kind of application. But even the spatial augmented reality that like, like we do is like, how is the world gonna be part of the, you know, the, will be captured and interactive? So, so I think this is a, an exciting era of observing the, the, the world. And the more you observe and time lapse, like you saw us doing during the fire, just mm -hmm. that Pacheco Canyon burn, you know, it can inspire, a, again, a sixth grader saying, oh, I've seen that same kind of pattern at a different time scale, but it's the same interaction. So if I can program an eddy in a river in fluid dynamics, well, I can do a tornado or a hurricane or, or how... Um, Ants find food with these two fields. Oh, that's the same way that two, a lightning strike comes down from the top and the bottom of the sky and makes a low resistant plasma channel, which is a lightning strike. And, and there'd be another one is tracking lightning. Where's where, you know, right now we do it in the electromagnetic uh, sensors, which is light too, but, but doing it visually as well as uh, at, at, at the different wavelengths that lightning is currently tracked. You know, if two people shoot it at that moment, you know, exactly where it is. Same thing with a meteor coming in through the atmosphere. So it's a great time for observation. And we have the tools ubiquitous. That, that surprises me if you ask me in the 80s, will we have the level of computation in our pockets with all of the capabilities beyond computing, you know, that level of screen and interaction, GPS, the camera, the incredible camera capability, you know, with that kind of portability and battery, um, that's pretty remarkable. So that, that does make me wonder if we didn't have the level of computing that we do today, what what you think you would be up to. There's there's always kind of this analog versus digital conversation that comes up, I've realized, in all mediums. So say yeah. if all of a sudden that just maybe existed and, and didn't exist sure. tomorrow, like where, where would that take you? Yeah, so this analog digital and also in science, uh, continuous and discrete are very interested. And it's always a hybrid. In high school and college, I also was really enjoyed photography and got into infrared photography. And there was that process of uh, the dark room. And, oh, man, I messed that one up and got to go reprint it. But I really enjoyed photography. I, I, uh, so that's a very analog and very tangible. You know, the sand table itself is very tangible and analog, right? Uh, and, and not just off in the pure digital. And again, we're trying to merge the digital with the, the analog. You know, it took us 30 years to capture the world digitally and bring it into the computer. And I think it's the next 20 years of bringing the digital out into our world. We had a nice collaboration in like 2011 with a sculptor in town, Paul Block, you may know him, marble sculptor. The theme of his piece was the transition of classical amusement to jazz. And he represented the classical as very continuous curved forms. And then jazz at the top of the piece was very angular. And they had a compression piece in the middle. And, and what we did was project on that. We projection mapped it so that when people could wave their hand and play different beats. And he thought, you know, the percussion was the transition from the classical to the jazz as well, the different uh, tempo and rhythm. Hopping between the two or also, when we look at spatial versus temporal, you can go, you can look at an image, a photograph, an image in this normal spatial domain, or you can pop it over into the frequency domain, which is an interesting, bit. that's like how JPEG compression works and, or is related to that. So, so moving between these continuous and discrete uh, or analog and, and, and digital is very exciting. So if I didn't have, but to answer directly the question, if I didn't have as much computing, I would I would be expressing myself somewhere in just more analog, I guess, or or just like I mentioned, what's the least amount of computing you need to um, to express yourself? So back even in two thousand ninety two or ninety three, you know, we were ex we were doing multimedia on floppies, right? Like the disk mm -hmm. mailers that AOL would send out, we would do those animations, and to get that all down into 200 or 400k with full sound and graphics 
know, some people do it down with just two Ks, you know, but that's always a nice experiment or how far can you compress down what you're doing and not waste. Right now, we have so much computing, so much bandwidth. We always want more, but it's many times the constraint drives the creative, right? So you would adapt. Yeah, and for us, uh, you know, our company, you know, it's we're developers, so uh, actually, and we had some, you know, some remote workers that would come in, you know, from Albuquerque twice or three times a week, but COVID really forced our company to adopt remote first workflow, so that everything mm-hmm. more on Slack, more on Zoom, which then makes us adapt or rethink as we're reopening. What's the office for, right? And you know, where in the past a lot of it was here's someone's workstation area. We're we're moving away from that. And definitely this when you're coming into the office, this should be a much more collaborative use. Because we can get our own work done at home and we're 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 actually more productive, I think, this year. First of all, because I was also traveling, you know, two hundred flights a year, you know, with customers right. and but and, and you lose that think with the team, right? If you're waiting for a whiteboard meeting, going to Sweden for a a weekend meeting, right? It's just or or DC for a three hour meeting. That was just insane. Right. right? And and unnecessary, you yeah. maybe learned. I think it's this generation of I would just say the you know generalization, the fifty to sixty year old managers that would kind of almost demand an in person meeting. Now right. it's like, okay, you, you better justify why someone's getting on a flight if we can't do this over a Zoom. Right. But now when you do go out, how do you redesign spaces? Because you're competing with what you could do at home. It better afford a much more expressive and rich interaction than what you can do online. The business is Redfish. Yeah, so Redfish is kind of the R&D. SimTable is a product company that we, that's fun out. Our next product is Real-Time Earth. So if you think of Google Earth, but real time from with you know right now google earth the imagery could be a year old but this is all bottom up crowdsourced imagery and models so that it's a living earth redfish has been my company since uh, ni- 1990 and every 5 years it kind of changes as you know pre press multimedia in the early 90s china in the mid 90s agent based modeling for maybe 10 years as consultancy here in santa fe so really the sim table is tail wagging the dog redfish you know, mostly got consumed by supporting wildfire, but but any surface and real time earth are much more general than wildfire, which in the analog and the digital, mm-hmm. it's real there. You got a, a very analog fire, you got analog people trying to evacuate, and how do you use digital information to coordinate them? So I am I'm curious about the name of the business. Sim table is very specific, right, about the product, the simulation table. And Redfish is very general. In the early 90s, we had kind of a, a my, with my father, kind of a engineering name of a, it was S quad, like S to the fourth power, strategic systems software solutions, I think it was. And when we were restructuring, we wanted to come up with something that was more general. We settled on Redfish. And, you know, a little bit one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish uh, from Dr. Seuss. The red and the fish are very fortunate symbols in China. Mm, so, uh, okay. you know, and I was I was going over to China to do Chinese English dictionaries in with multimedia back when CD ROMs were uh, a thing. It was a little China inspired. So when you started the company, like like what is that story? There had to have been some maybe some struggles, maybe some questioning. I didn't have family yet and and mortgages, so that was a very low risk thing and. I knew I was pretty unemployable, <laughs> so I was you know, always kind of um, independent contractor. So, so that was actually a relatively low risk thing. Uh, you know, the challenge is actually focusing. There's very, um, there's all many, many different kinds of things you can do, especially in graphics. And you know, I'm always exploring. And how do you now, behind behind what we're doing, monetize or put together some kind of business structure to to capitalize on it, you know, in many ways, the sim table you know, is that, but we're also, you know, pushing onto this real time earth. So it's important to put together processes and people that can, that can really grow what you've already explored. You know, there's a lot of work in, you know, I would say it's a 20 to one, you explore and get an idea, but it's 20 times the effort to get that into a product and 
listen, you know, listen to with customers and get the, um, you know, get it actually useful to them, right? Compared to a concept. Mm-hmm. But I, I would say I've never been, uh, I think it's always better to have five customers or clients than one employer. <laughs> you know, I think that that has a lot of risk too. And, and stress, like you don't have as much control. Now it's definitely feast and famine, you know, as anyone that's done small business. You have no regrets about starting your own business. No, I mean, but I did move here for a job, but it was with uh, Bios Group, which was uh, started up by my mentor, uh, Stuart Kaufman, who studied his origin of life and was one of the founders of the Santa Fe Institute or, or there at the early days. And so that was a commercial venture consulting on complexity to Fortune 100s and, and government. So there was two years there where I worked for that group. And that's probably the only time I've had employment. But that was an exciting time. But there I did miss a little bit of um, being able to zig and zag a little bit. You know, in a company, you can do bigger projects. But as a consultancy, we were still pieced up into, you know, teams. So it wasn't like there was one big thing we were making. No regret. And I, I think, I don't think I could last very long in a company as an employee. And? Maybe uh, there's a little more flexibility in terms of skiing. <laughs> you know, one thirty or one o'clock. You know, there's the time to do gradient descent research, as we call it, at the office. <laughs> right. Or or maybe you need to film controlled burns. That's right. From the south burn on the on the south burn, north burn. We mm-hmm. do, we call it also fuels inspection to uh, go into the glades and see how the vegetation's doing. All all very important data. So in terms of art and technology, are there any artists you think other people should know about? Fred Tarbell. I was always liked his work from, you know, his algorithmic iterations. And he was big into Flash in the early 2000s and now is into processing. So there's this whole generative art world. And I do like on the tech side, too, just people that put together very strong visualization tool sets, but are also artistic as they do it. The, the author of 3JS goes by Mr. Dube, but also Mike uh, Bostock, you know, making a tool set called D3, but a very strong artist there. A lot of the cartographers, when you get into cartography, there's a, you know, the aesthetic of, of mapping is not just, not, not just the technical, you know, and companies like Stamen uh, doing that work. Uh, Joe Dean is one of the earlier explorers in dome projection and lighting. I always love you know, what he's playing with. Uh, and then just when you talk about analog, so someone like a James Terrell, you know, just what, what is he doing purely with analog and, and the passing of the day? So that's very, very impressive to me or just something to follow. In fact, my ski pass has James Terrell beard with my face from Photoshop. Are there uh, movies you've watched recently? I feel like that's been a bigger part of everyone's life in this past year. Oh, certainly, yeah. When go out. You know, with my son, I really appreciate what, like, the Star Wars, Clone Wars, and The Mandalorian did from a visual, right? The, the Just the visual style of Clone Wars, that angular, soft, pastel uh, animation. Really um, like that. You know, and this is also exciting when you get to meet the people later. Mind's Eye was an animation bit back in... And then pre SIGGRAPH, which is the um, technical meets science meets art of graphics, the special interest group graphics of the ACM, the Association of Computing Machinery. You know, back then, there was an animation, Stanley and Stella Break the Ice, which was basically the early use of uh, flocking models to meet Craig Reynolds later at an Artificial Life Conference. But also Clayana Scotzi and you know, that whole uh, triplet with the time-lapse cities and the modern urban dynamics. But then to finally... You know, meet Jeffrey Riojo and um, Alton Walpole was off Santa Fe, right? And, you know, they later made Baraka. There's something about the time lapse that really kicked me off. You know, I was like 18, 17. Changing time. And that's, I think, when we make simulations, too. It's like playing with time. You see different patterns as you as you scrub time and, and the rate of time. And that's why, you know, just and encouraging people now with our phone, you know, hyperlapse is so easy to use, put down four times, you know, powers of two, 32 times is good for clouds or 4096 is good for a day. It's an exciting time that that's sitting in our pocket where you imagine what it took back then for them to do a time lapse where we, we could just shoot these on our GoPros and our phones. 
uh, and, and messing with the time lapse. That, that's very exciting. And again, but it's also exciting just to meet the people behind that. I guess the beauty of technology and art that's in the technical world, and even science too, is like, especially in computing, all the names that you learn about are still alive, right? And even one of our programmers, who was an early, early Macintosh team, you know, in 84. So all these, all these people are around and still, still working too. In fact, we have a person in town, Roger Fry, who worked at uh, the early BBN the birth of the internet but he has the distinction of being and he's still employed uh the long the oldest continuous employed programmer so, so roger fight there's a little shout out to him he's in town so there's a lot of um giant shoulders to stand on as well so as i mentioned Stu kaufman you know scientist and origin of life yeah, i would read him from beijing and but now to have a 20-year mentoring relationship and you know, working with him that it's a very exciting so it's very you know find a mentor and, and, and be a mentor well and that's a fascinating thing about the internet it has not been a, around our entire lives maybe maybe for some people listening it has but over um, the web yeah <laughs> it has not been around my entire life or your entire life but it kind of feels that way right mm-hmm. so that, that is fascinating that, that, that people that are that involved in the origin of it are, are just, they're hanging around in Santa Fe. That, that's yeah. a cool thing. People say there's certain kinds of thinking that can happen here that can't happen on the coast, whether in the Bay Area or up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I think it attracts a certain kind of retiring academic, retiring scientist, artists. And so you have this opportunity that they're here. So the more that you can get like a 17-year-old connecting to these people and, and working with them, that, that's an exciting opportunity if there's uh, mechanisms for doing that. And there's mentorship programs like, you know, Monte del Sol uh, had really good mentoring. We need, we need more of that in spaces where people can share ideas like so that. Santa Fe. You've lived in Santa Fe for a minute. And one of the things that Santa Fe is also famous for is chili. So I am curious, do you have a favorite... Or are you a Christmas guy? Started with uh, green when I got here. Then I really appreciated the red. I had a red period. You know, breakfast burritos were also very important to me in relation to this. You know, Horseman's Haven, obviously, or El Toreador. Christmas, I, I, I no longer do. That's just uh, too, you, you, you pick a lane. Uh, that was like I didn't want to make a choice. I don't think there's anything emergent in Christmas. Sometimes flavors create an emergence. So we both love Santa Fe, but another thing I've been curious about recently is just other places you've traveled that you would want to return to. You know, I was very fortunate to last summer, prior to COVID, the summer before, do a business trip, Inner Mongolia, and then Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, and um, Shenzhen. And Hangzhou, as I mentioned before, in the 12th century, but now that's also the headquarters, Alibaba and Westlake, kind of the second tier towns in China are very appealing to me right now. Also, we have a strong relationship with Venice and Italy. We've sent three employees over there, exchange, and we work with an academic uh, entrepreneur, Javier Carrera, and the Venice Project Center. So Venice is really special. And then also in Lyon, Spain, Spain is of interest. I just enjoy traveling. I do miss that stimulation for sure. And I do like working. When you travel, you're working with the people there versus just touristing, right? And, you know, just going to the museums and things, which is great. But I always enjoy doing projects in different countries and I think you really get a sense of the dynamic and, and you get brought into a community when you're doing that too. So just encourage others to, to work around the world. It's easier than ever. Maybe not as easy. Time travel. Mm-hmm. If, if you have a time travel ticket and you could go anywhere past or present, do you know where that would be? Not too far in the future. 50 years seems reasonable that I could still recognize a lot of the technology, but be amazed in the same way that 1980, you know, we're looking at 40 years now, you know, and to see a phone. You know, going forward, uh, you know, 2060, it'd be nice to see what, what, what things would be going on. Two years ago, I would not have predicted now at all. So 2060, who knows? And in your, your world with photography and photo eye, and you know, you've tracked a, a similar trajectory with analog to digital and photography, right? Where do you think photography is going to go in the next uh, 10 to 50 years? That is a good question. I mean, there's the obvious, it used to be all analog and now it's primarily digital, but then there's also been a major pushback of 
because it's so digital, people are returning to the, the earliest processes possible, which includes people making photographs that don't even include cameras, which is so disconnected from what people believe to be photography now, because we all have cell phone camera combinations and, and, and kind of like science, like you were talking about, there's also a lot of hybrid where maybe you take the best parts of analog and the best parts of digital and you put them together. But the other thing that's happened recently is there's this whole surge in NFTs. And those have actually been around for about 10 years, but it was actually that Christie's auction recently where that people piece sold for 60 some thousand where people just started going crazy and people started- A million, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, million. I can't <laughs> even comprehend it. People started minting like, weird things like tweets. And so I'm curious to see where, where that's going to go. Photographs are typically additioned and addition sizes keep getting smaller and smaller. And I've been joking for years that eventually we were going to move to negative additions where we wouldn't print them at all. And that's kind of what these uh, NFTs are kind of looking at where they're, they're not printed. I mean, it's a, it's a JPEG and you can see it online, but, but one particular person owns it. Someone who actually loves the physical object. I'm a little conflicted on that level, but, but it's fascinating. Yeah, you know, we had a camera obscura set up at the complex. You know, when, you, when it's just a pinhole, it, you know, it takes a long time for the eyes to adjust. But we had a pretty decent lens in there. And I just remember holding up a piece of white poster board and creating an image from the lens at different scales and zooms. There was something stirred in me that was different of seeing a analog continuous image growing up seeing a rosette or a pixel, but just to see the beauty of light on, on, as an image. We're doing a little bit with NFTs or a, a system called the Aseki that's away from Different than the cloud is up a kind of more, uh, much more grounded. If you think of the metaphor of an estate of a grounded water system that has a social governance system around it. We want the same thing for data, but you know, one of the things that NFT affords is that connection downstream so that if someone did purchase this, there could be a continuing relationship with the artist. Or you can put contracts compared to a, an artist put something out and you have distributors there's very little tangible connection. I think there's this ability to build up these networks through the pieces and the provenance that can go with that. So I think that's an exciting opportunity that the piece becomes the bridge or the, or the connector of communities. I think there is a certain particular amazing uses for this. The royalty, kind of like you're talking about, if you, if you sell something repeatedly that the original creator that's right. Gets credit every time, which is something that's never really existed or has been harder to track when it comes to art and music historically. You you mentioned historical too, so and time travel. One of the things we do is we're able to, if we can find a couple points of reference in an image, solve for the camera lens and position, right? So the whole re-photography uh, community, but taking all the photographs historically and being able to put those into a space, right? That, that's very navigable and attachable, you know, other meta information attachable to it. So that might be a, a place of, of intersection between us, especially the New Mexico State Archives. You know, there's, there's a concept of a light field, which is at this point, here's all the rays that, that come into that point. At the end of the day, a whole collection of, of photographs is a, is a sparse light field. You know, you know, what is that as a collection? That's a, that's an interesting artistic technical place to explore without necessarily going commercial in the beginning, right? George O'Keefe's paintings and trying to reconstruct the location. You know, that kind of you know relationship as well. I think this can open up some some things that weren't possible before. I I don't know what it is, but I look forward to it. Well, well, thanks so much, Stephen. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, let's let's stay in touch. Okay. See you on the mountain. Too. Well, thank you, and and have a good night, and talk to you soon. Okay, Ed. Thank you. Thank you for watching Art in the Raw. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please do me a solid and like, comment, and subscribe. Have a good night. <laughs>
And then this is now with cameras being able to overlay digital information of like where people are or a cruise, but also drawing on the image to say we need a bulldozer to go up this line 